My name's Christina von Nolken. I teach Old English here. And because I teach Old English here, I frequently encounter those intrepid medieval pirates, explorers, and traders, known as the Vikings, who left their mark on much of the known world for about the, eighth, the late 8th century until the late 11th century AD. Um, and I've developed some of this material in, partly in conjunction with wonderful alumni trips, accompanying wonderful alumni trips around Scandinavia. And I really wish that we were all at the moment just sort of jaunting around the fjords. That would be very nice, but I can't manage that for you. Well, because I, the sources are mainly English, um, I normally encounter the Vikings in a pretty negative light but they contributed a very great deal to early English culture and language, and therefore to the, to the culture of the later English-speaking world. Um, the term Viking means something like sea raider. There's a feminine noun um, in um, Icelandic, in Old Norse, um, viking, meaning piracy. And vik could refer to the large bay near Oslo, um, so it may be thought that they originated from there, or it could refer to a bay in general. Anyway, the story of the Vikings is usually taken, and not just by English historians, as starting and ending with events in England. Its end is marked by the year 1066, although Viking-like raids did continue in the Scottish islands for a good, wheel, good while after this. But 1066 saw the defeat and death of King Harold Hardrada, the hard of counsel, or the ruthless. Um, or he was king of Norway, and he was the last of the great Vikings. And in 1066, he made an unsuccessful bid for the English throne. 1066 also saw the beginning of the end of what had become a markedly Anglo-Scandinavian culture in England, and this time it was because the Normans also invaded in this year, successfully, bringing with them a new prestige language and a heavily French-influenced culture. Now, if Harold Hadrada had been more successful, the later history of England would have looked very different. But with William the Conqueror's invasion, Viking energy was replaced by Norman energy in Europe generally. Now, the Normans were quite as ruthless as the Vikings, they were, after all, ultimately part Viking themselves. But they relied on different technologies. So instead of relying primarily on ships, they ran around planting castles around the place. And by this time, they had a very different culture. Well, as I say, the beginning of the Vikings' recorded story is also usually marked by an event in England. And this was a raid on an English monastery situated on the west coast of, Lin of Northumberland, Northumbria um, in those days, Lindisfarne. It is on your map. Um, it's about the top um, place name on that England, Ireland, and Dane law map. I also have a picture of the raiders on the same side of the map. Um, so that, that was 793, and it's taken as the beginning. But it wasn't, in fact, quite the first time that Viking-like raiders had caused trouble in England. So here is the entry for 787 in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which was an English work compiled some century later out of earlier oral and written sources. It's about an event that occurred on the south coast of England in Portland, um, in Dorset, it's actually also on the map. And this is how the, read, the entry reads, um, 787. In this year came the, f the first three ships of Norwegians, and the overseer tried to get them to go to the royal manor, for he did not know what they were, and then they slew him. Well, what's so striking is the total unexpectedness of this happening. The overseer of what must have been the royal estates had expected to find peaceful traders, and what he got was people who lived by totally different rules. The event provides a fitting overture for the one that is usually taken to mark the beginning of the Viking Age, the even more shocking raid on Lindisfarne. And here is the relevant chronicle entry for that year. In this year, 793, 
terrible portents appeared over Northumbria and miserably frightened the inhabitants. These were exceptional flashes of lightning, and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. A great famine soon followed these signs, and a little after that, on the 8th of June, the harrying of the heathen miserably destroyed God's church in Ninisfarne. It was an event that traumatized the whole of the Western Christian world. This is what one Englishman, Alcuin of York, had to say about it. Lo, it is nearly 350 years that we and our fathers have inhabited this most lovely land, and never before has such terror appeared in it as we have now suffered from a pagan race. Behold the church spattered with the blood of priests, despoiled of all its ornaments, and given as a prey to pagan peoples. What should be expected for other places when the divine judgment has not spared this holy place? Well, what should be expected apart from a lot of trouble? And this trouble was from people who would be around for a very long time. These peoples emerged out of all three Scandinavian homelands, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. They'd long been raiders, usually preying on each other, although they must, normal, they must primarily have lived by farming, fishing, trading. But what distinguishes the Vikings from their predecessors is their lethally fast-moving ships. The ships were light enough that they could be hauled overland for short differences, and they could float in only a meter of water. This meant that they could be rowed far up rivers. It also meant that horses could easily be led in and out. Um, I have a picture, sort of picture of a ship on the handout. Well, at first, the users of these ships seemed to have only used oars, but by the time they swooped on Lindisfarne, the shipwrights had learned how to add keels without sacrificing the shallow draft. And then with the keels came sails, so that the ships could also be effective on the open seas. Each of these ships was capable of taking some 40 to 50 fighting men, though that a warship that's been found near Roskulde in Denmark was 118 feet long and capable of carrying 100 warriors. Uh, you may have noticed that there's been a recent ship burial found in Scotland, as the first in the sort of main English, uh, Great Britain island they've got. It was, it's, a, it's a ship burial, it's not one of these huge ones. Anyway, um, the Vikings had certainly mastered latitude sailing. They depended a lot for navigation on land sightings, that's clear from the sources. But there is some discussion that they might have um, had a means also of dealing with longitude. Conditions in the Scandinavian homelands encouraged this kind of ra raiding. Basically, there wasn't enough arable land to go round, which is a point especially true of Norway. And there seems to have been an expanding population, not least of well-born sons wanting to outdo their fathers. Now, one power-hungry Norwegian king, Harold Finehair, had at least nine sons uh, um, who reached manhood, and some accounts say 20. And his less successful but no less power-hungry son, Eric Bloodaxe, had at least eight sons. Now, Eric probably got his name from the effectiveness with which he did away with most of his brothers and half-brothers. So sons like Eric would set off all over the known world in search of alternative wealth and perhaps a place, even a kingdom, to settle. And I've given you an, a, 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 a map of the Viking world to give you some sense. Um, okay, about Harold Fine here, we might as well get his name down. His date's about 850 to 933. He ruled 972 to 930 prolific producer of sons. Um, now, he was once a petty king known as Harold Shaggy Hair. And the story is that a certain Gyda rejected him as a husband because he was such a very petty king. Whereupon he swore that he would not comb or cut his hair until the whole of Norway paid him allegiance. And once he'd indeed subdued the whole country, sometimes, it seems, simply by hacking people's arms and legs off, his hair was cut, combed, and it proved most lovely to behold. <laughs>
Well, as I say, these raiding, trading, land-grabbing people emerged out of all three Scandinavian homelands. Today, I'm most concerned with their push west, though let me also note that the Vikings, and especially Viking, Swedish Vikings, also very definitely de demonstrated their talents as explorers and fighters in the east in ways that seemed highly romantic to contemporaries and descendants back at home. The Danes mainly expanded along the North Sea coast towards France and then north and south from there. They sacked Paris in 861. They raided in Spain. They pressed through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean. They sacked Luna, a small town in northern Italy, apparently thinking it was Rome. They settled Normandy in 911, so here we have the ancestors of those later raiding peoples, the Normans. And most important to me today, Danish-led Vikings almost completely took over England in the 9th century, and in a later wave of invasion, they did take it over in the 11th. So that from 1013 to 1035, they actually provided England with her kings, namely Swain Forkbeard, 1014 to 16, Canute, 1016 to 35, Harold Harefoot, that's Harold I, 1035 to 40, and half a Canute, 1040 to 42. The Norwegians also pushed west from their more northerly base, sometimes merely raiding, but also, very importantly, setting up settlements. In the Faroe Islands, from about 825, they drove, there they drove out the Irish monks who'd been using the islands as a retreat. They also settled the Scottish islands, um, Ireland, Dublin was founded as a base, particularly for slave trading in 841. They settled in northern England and in the Isle of Man. And in about 870 to 930, they settled Iceland. And at the end of the 10th century, some Icelanders, of course, moved on to parts of Greenland. And finally, of particular interest here in, to us, um, in the year 1002 or so, they set up outposts in America almost five centuries before Columbus. Going back to that terrifying raid in 793. Now this evidently gave rise to the idea back home in Norway that English monasteries were simply there to provide raiders with valuable loot. So one year later, another Viking band plundered another nearby monastery at Jaro. But they were caught in a storm after returning to their ships, and they were either drowned or were killed by the locals when they crawled out of the water. This gave the English confidence in God, plus some time to arrange their coastal defenses. And the result was a lull for over a generation, while the raiders concentrated on more exposed people like the Irish, where infights among chieftains made things easy for them, or the people living in what we think of as Scotland. Um, and in 795, um, the ancient Scottish monastery in the western island of Iona was plundered. And it would be sacked again in 802, 806, and 807. And at that, the abbot and the surviving monks moved to Kells in Ireland, um, and they were probably bearing with them the Book of Kells, um, which is now housed in Trinity College, Dublin, but which does go on display sometimes in this country. Um, some of you may have seen it or reproductions of it. Um, if you have, you'll probably agree with the 12th century scholar, Gerald of Wales, that it's so intricately and beautifully executed that one might think it the work of an angel and not of a man. And the monks were therefore able, they therefore saved it for us by moving. Well, the raids did begin again in England in about 835. And this time it was from large Danish dominated groups coming in from the southeast. So they hit Southampton in 840, Rochester and London 842, Dorset 843. And increasingly, these new groups wanted to settle in England's green and pleasant land. And we get the first ominous reference to their spending the winter in England in 850. And the heathen, for the first time, remained over the winter. So we've reached a new stage in our story. 
In 865, a great heathen army arrived on the scene, led by three Danish brothers, Halfdan, Uppi, and Ivar the Boneless. If he's the reason you've come to this talk, well, now you have him. Um, these brothers were reputedly the sons of Ragnar Lordbrook, that is, hairy bricks or hairy pants. He was a semi-mythical king of Denmark. Well, tradition has it that the brothers had already tried to outdo their father in a raid on yet another northern English monastery at Whitby. Now, they'd chosen Whitby because this, th they thought, would set them against a force mightier than any their father had ever encountered, even though he had successfully fought against a dragon. Well, the force was that, was that of the Christian's god. For as the brothers pointed out disapprovingly, at Whitby, men had been accustomed to make sacrifices in a mighty temple. Well, the results of this clash between paganism and Christianity were mixed. One of the brothers, there were four on that occasion, was killed, but the other three did very well indeed. Well, the 14th century or so Icelandic saga that recounts this story, it was it was composed well after Iceland became Christian, so the humor around this is absolutely deliberate. Well, I do want to note, though, that historically it may well be that some early raiders may have seen themselves as seriously engaged in a religious war. Um, if so, they had pretty good reason, because the Christians were imposing, were perpetrating horrors on their fellow pagans in continental Europe. Um, for example, in 782, um, Charlemagne forcibly baptized and then executed some 4,500 unarmed Saxons at Verden, which is just south of the Jutland Peninsula, so news of this would get back fast to Denmark. Well, given their success against the Christians' God, it's hardly surprising that Halfdan, Uppi, and Ivar the Boneless returned to England in 865. But this time, at least according to tradition, it was to avenge their father. The story is that Ragnar had recently come to his end in a snake pit at the hands of Ella, the English king of Northumbria. Ragnar wasn't one to stop raiding just because his sons were trying to outdo him. Now, we do know of other Scandinavian heroes who wound up in snake pits, and it's been suggested that some Odin ritual was involved. But in Ragnar's case, the death was nicely personalized, in that one of his adventures had, as I said, involved killing a dragon. And that's when he put on his hairy skins. These had been boiled in pitch and then rolled in sand, and it was a good way of making um, dragon blood slide off you. As you know, dragon blood is very, very lethal. So that's why he became known as Hairy Pants, or Hairy Bricks. <laughs> Oops. Um, anyway, Ragnar recognized the irony of this personalized death. My bane I did not expect from a worm, but fate is oft not the thing we thought. Needless to say, however, he endured his death with characteristic aplomb. According to one version of the story, and we have several, he sang a perfectly splendid death song while the snakes hung all over him. Um, this was after all his protective clothing, including presumably the hairy pants, had been removed from him. Well, the poem we have, the death song, is probably Icelandic and 12th century, but some scholars think it does look back to early materials. It runs through some 28 stanzas that run on this kind of pattern. We hewed with the sword. It is long, lo not long since that I journeyed to Gautland to slaughter the snake. Thora the maiden I won in that fray. And men call me Lordbrook because of the deed when my mighty spear slew the mighty drake or more generally, we hewed with the sword. It is meet and just that man should face man where drawn swords sing. No thane should flinch back from his fellow thane. The bold man has hardily fought, and the lover of maids loves the battle din. 
Well, the death song finally moves away from this pattern to end on a truly triumphant note. I'm using a different translation here. It gladdens me that Odin made ready the benches. Soon shall we be drinking ale from the curved horns. The champion who comes into Odin's dwelling does not lament his death. I shall not come into his hall with words of fear on my lips. Eager I am to depart. I laugh as I die. Well, other versions of Ragnar's death make him more laconic. The young pigs would grumble if they knew what the old one was suffering, he said. And grumble the young pigs, that is, Ingwar Ubbi and Ivar the Boneless, did. After widespread pillage and slaughter, they took the city of York, which would long remain a Viking stronghold. And there they reputedly sacrificed King Ella to Odin by carving the blood eagle on him. This, rather horrifically, involved wrenching the ribs away from the backbone and pulling the lungs through. And this was meant to look like an eagle. Um, as the saga writer puts it, King Ella was very sore before the carving was completed. <laughs> And having performed this ritual, the brothers parted company with Ivar turning north and the other two moving into the English Midlands and East Anglia. Well, perhaps you're wondering why Ivar was called the boneless. And I, for a long time, assumed it was because he was good at gymnastics. And I sort of pictured him bouncing around like someone on a pogo stick. But according to mediev the medieval, one the medieval account, it was because Ragnar, his father, insisted on sleeping with his mother, that is, um, Ivar's mother, immediately after marrying her, even though she said he should wait for three nights in order to save their about-to-be-conceived son from the lasting harm of bonelessness. Of course, Ragnar wouldn't listen. So Ivar was born with gristle instead of bone, and had to be carried everywhere. But there was nothing soft about his brain as he did all his brother's planning. He was the head, they were the limbs. It's a very common motif in Scandinavian literature, in early Scandinavian literature. Um, one thing people do agree about, though, even when they think it was only made of gristle, is that he was extraordinarily tall. And there is a grave that some archaeologists think was his at Repton in Derbyshire, that according to a 17th century description, once housed a body nine feet tall with a massive skull. They took away the skull, skull and of course it's now lost. Um, so it is just possible. There are other reasons. I'll come back to that grave. There are reasons to think it was his. Um, but bones or no bones, um, he turned north, of course, and he was preceded by his reputation. And this was so terrible that uh, the nuns of a monastery on the Firth of Forth reputedly cut off their noses and upper lips in order to preserve their virginity. They were totally successful. Now, <laughs> Eva, Eva was really rather experienced in the ways of nuns. He'd, taken quite a lot along with him and that sort of thing. But this lot absolutely disgusted him, so he simply burnt them up in their monastery. He also, on this journey, and this is more historical, dispatched hundreds, maybe thousands of captives to the slave markets of Dublin, where he'd maneuvered his way to being king. Um, the trip north had probably been to expand um, Dublin's commercial interests. Well, he died in 871 or so, seemingly of a hideous disease and in England. And if his was indeed the body at Repton, it was surrounded by the disarticulated bones of more than 250 people. And these were well-developed people, but their bones don't, didn't show, don't show the signs of battle-related trauma. Um, we have modern archaeologists. There's been modern work done on this. Um, it looks as if they died of some kind of plague, some presumably horror, hideous disease. Um, ergotism due to contaminated grain has been suggested 
Well, while Ivar was conducting his business in the north, his brothers turned south. First, the impious crew subdued the Midland Kingdom of Mercia. You've got a map of England here. And then they moved into East Anglia, where in 869 they killed the king, Edmund. Um, they perhaps did this with the aid of a blood eagle. But if Edmund was a loser in life, which he undoubtedly was, in later story he became a winner, a saintly figure who, wishing to follow Christ, simply threw away his weapons. And the Vikings, in conformity with their recognized role as emissaries of Satan, obligingly filled him with arrows, like a hedgehog, or if you prefer, like St. Sebastian. And I've put a picture of him on the back of the handout. Um, the brothers, after disposing of Edmund, then turned their attention south. And by the later ninth century, it seemed as if they would take possession of the whole of England. A century later, of course, they would do exactly this. But this time round, they didn't quite succeed. And this was largely because, of, thanks to King Alfred, he died in 899. Um, from 871, he was king of the southwest kingdom of Wessex, um, which was the only part of the country at that point that remained English rather than Scandinavian. And even there, things had become so bad that Alfred was driven deep into the Somerset marshes where, story has it, he took refuge in a herdsman's hut. And this story was known to all English school children when I was a school child. Um, it's what most people know about King Alfred. He was so overwhelmed by his troubles in this hut that he let the cakes, the oat cakes, burn. What sort of careless man are you, shouted the herdsman's wife, not knowing who he was. You neglect to turn ash-baked bread, and yet when it's put in front of you, you rush to eat it. The king patiently replied, It is, as you say, good hostess, for I would be exceedingly slow even if I knew how to deal with ash-baked bread. Well, alas, this best-known fact about King Alfred's apparent slowness seems to be a much later fabrication. More importantly, it was from such a refuge in the marshes that miraculously, it would seem, he gathered an army and routed that pestilential mob. Not that he was able to drive the foul plague out of the country, for many of the filthy crew, I'm quoting a chronicler who was working in 975, many of the filthy crew were there to stay. But he settled them in the eastern parts of the country where there was a good chance that they would simply take up farming and vote conservative. And on the whole, they did. And you've got, you've got a map marking the area of the Dane law um, where they were roughly settled. Um, anyway, I'll read the key entry from the chronicle of this turnaround that uh, Alfred was able to make at least as far as the extreme south of the country was concerned. In this year, the enemy host rode over Wessex and occupied it, and drove a large part of the inhabitants over sea, and the rest they reduced to submission, except Alfred the king. And he, with a small company, moved through the woods and into inaccessible places in the marshes. And the Easter after, King Alfred, with a small company, built a fortification at Athelney, and from that fortification he continued fighting. Then, in the seventh week after Easter, there came to meet him all the men of Somerset and Wiltshire and that part of Hampshire nearest him. One day later, he fought against the entire host and put it to flight. And then the host gave him hostages and solemn oaths that they would leave his kingdom and promised him, in addition, that their king would receive baptism. And three weeks later, the king Guthrum came to him and Alfred stood sponsor to him at baptism. And Guthrum was 12 days with the king, who greatly honored him and his companions with riches. Well, Alfred was trying hard. Guthrum and he had in fact already negotiated at least one piece sworn on Guthrum's sacred ring. And that would have been the ring of the god Odin. But Odin was highly untrustworthy as gods go, 
and oaths sworn on his ring had little chance of lasting. So that's why this time round, Alfred invoked the Christian God. It was an uncertain business. We have a probably apocryphal story of a Dane who complained that the white robe he was given at his most recent baptism was not nearly of such fine quality as his two previous ones. <laughs> but oddly enough, Alfred's diplomacy worked this time round, and things did calm down for a couple of generations. So we now have Scandinavians enjoying their own kingdoms and their own law. The word law is Scandinavian, it's theirs. They were um, enjoying that in the north and east of England, and there was a recognizably English culture maintaining itself in the south. We don't have very much information about the goings-on in Scandinavian England in this period because the English mainly controlled the written record. But relations between the English and Scandinavian communities do seem often to have been good, especially given that the Scandinavian communities became increasingly Christianized. And partly as a result, Alfred's children, and interestingly, especially his daughter, um, and the next generation, his grandchildren, were able to regain control of quite large parts of the country. Um, it does seem that to some extent the Scandinavianized communities welcomed the kind of stability they associated with the English. And in 954, even York was recaptured. Now this happened, I'm happy to say, after Eric Bloodaxe, who'd maneuvered himself into being king there, um, he was, in fact, the last Viking king of York, after he was killed in a minor skirmish. What's thundering there like a host marching? asks Bragi, god of poetry, in a poem commissioned by Eric's widow. The noise betokens that Eric shall come, Odin replies. Why are you waiting for Eric so keenly? His was a bloody blade. Why rob him of victory if you thought him so bold? Because the grey wolf threatens the homes of the gods. Um, the reference to the grey wolf is to the final battle in which both gods and men will be defeated by the forces of chaos um, in Norse mythology. Um, but before that time, the warriors who would fight in it are greeted by Odin into Valhalla, and they'll have a splendid time just drinking until the final time comes. Well, alas, Eric's entry into Valhalla did not mean the end of Scandinavian invasion of England, far from it. Instead, to everyone's horror, there was a fresh wave of attacks starting in 981. In this year, for the first time, seven ships came and ravaged Southampton. And this time, things would climax with those Danish kings ruling the whole of England. So we have a further, further major story, in, a major chapter in our story, though it's one I can only gloss over today. There's a good deal of speculation about what motivated these fresh attacks. One factor seems to have been that the silver mines of the Arab Caliphate were just about exhausted, so that the Vikings had to look for their revenues elsewhere. But the attacks seem to have been differently organized from before, coming at least in part from highly disciplined forces trained in rigorous military camps in Denmark. And the English, by all accounts, were quite unable to resist. We have a moving poem about an incident in 991 in which they tried and failed. And the smitten corslet sang a doleful dirge, and Seoburna sang Grira Leotha Sum. It was a defeat that marked the beginning of a new system of simply buying the marauders off. It was decided for the first time to pay tribute to the Danes on account of the atrocities wrought along the seacoast. On this first occasion, it amounted to 10,000 um, pounds. The sums would increase over the years until they reached as much as 48,000 pounds. This is an enormous amount of money. England was astonishingly rich at the time. Well, on this occasion, 991, this defeat, the English were probably up against two formidable figures, Swain Forkbeard, 
who was king of Denmark since 988, and Olaf Tryggvason, who was about to become king of Norway. Well, of the two, Swain was the greater threat to England. But Olaf could juggle with three daggers, run across the oars outside the vessel when his men were rowing, and cast two spears at once. So I prefer to talk about him. <laughs> He's a great example of what later tradition would consider the paradigmatic Viking. Olaf's father, King Tryggvi, a grandson of Harold Finehair, was killed by a son of Eric Bloodaxe, therefore a cousin, when Olaf was a child. Obviously, Eric Bloodaxe and co. would have been glad to dispose of Olaf too. But Olaf's mother fled with him towards the Baltic. While they were en route, pirates snatched Olaf and sold him as a slave in Estonia. Fortunately for him, he was bought by decent folks. And even more fortunately, he was eventually spotted by his mother's brother, who happened to be passing through. And what attracted his uncle's eye was that the boy was so good looking. So his uncle bought him out of slavery, but not before Olaf managed to kill the pirate who had originally kidnapped him. Um, he was also, it seems, just passing through. <laughs> Olaf was then adopted by the king of Russia, but he also utterly charmed this queen to the extent that people started gossiping. What can he have to talk of so often with the queen? So Harold extracted himself from this potentially sticky situation by decamping for Poland, where he married the king's daughter. Being a considerate lady, she promptly died, leaving him with the wherewithal to start raiding in more westerly lands, and after joining up with Swain Forkbeard, raiding in England. Um, sometime after their victory in England, um, and this is historical, Olaf became ferociously Christian, and he then returned to Norway, where he made sure he became king. But then his luck ran out, and all because he would try to ram Christianity down unwilling Scandinavian throats. Now, one of his big failures involved his sending a powerful but murderous priest that he didn't like having around him off to convert Iceland. The priest's name was Thangbrad. Iceland didn't welcome this guy. It would, in fact, wait to be converted by rather more diplomatic means later. Because Thangbrand, who defended himself with a crucifix instead of a shield, was the death of at least three people there before they managed to kick him out. However, it, Olaf's main failure in the Christianization department was when he tried to convert Sigrid, Queen of Sweden, so that he could marry her. She politely refused to become Christian herself, but said he could be Christian if he wanted to. He overreacted. King Olaf was very wroth. Why should I wed thee, an old faded woman and a heathen bitch? And he struck her in the face with a glove. This may some day be thy death, said Sigrid, which it was in a sea battle on the Baltic in the year 1000. There, Olaf was attacked by a consortium of kings, including the one who would finally marry Sigrid. Realizing his time was up, he dived overboard and was never seen again. Now, there is an alternative account whereby he's standing on his ship. He had a very, very beautiful ship, the most beautiful ship that had ever been built in the, the Northern Lands. Um, he's standing on it, and a light shines from heaven upon him. And when the light vanished, so did he. <laughs> well, so much for him. More, more important in relation to England was Swain Forkbeard, whose career I have to gloss over, but who managed, not without provocation, to drive out the English king Ethelred. Ethelred Unrad, Ethelred the person with no counsel, Ethelred the unready. He drove him out and established himself as king in his place in 1013. Well, there'd been years of fighting, and Swain was a really tough guy, but he does seem to have been welcomed by everyone, even the English, um, who sort of welcomed, there will 
at least be a time of stability. The problem was that he died within six months. It took a while for his son Canute to win England back. Um, there was a good deal of fighting again. But once Canute did win England back, he ruled judiciously and well, according to our sources, um, he kept, he, he ruled from 1016 to 35, so he had a good stretch. And he did it, he, he mo adapted himself to the ideas of what Anglo-Saxon kingship, Anglo-Saxon Christian kingship involved. He was uh, very dedicated in his political piety. Well, he died in uh, 1035, there was more fighting involving his sons, Harold I and Harthur Commute, until at last the English house re-established itself in the form of Edward the Confessor. And he had another long reign. He, was, he reigned until 1066, and he died, of course, then without an heir. And it's at this point that our other grandly paradigmatic Viking, Harold Hardrada, made his unsuccessful bid for the English throne. Well, I'm very sorry, I can't get into Harold's story now. Um, it's e an even more splendid version than this story of Olaf Tryggvason. Um, it took him um, not just to the east and in love with various women there, but it took him right down to Byzantium. And we know he went there. We have confirmation in Byzantine sources that he was there. But according to our Scandinavian sources, he was wonderfully successful there. Successful there. He headed the emperor's elite guard. He le led the troops in all sorts of successful campaigns in uh, Sicily, North Africa, the Middle East. He, he was a trickster sort of person. He, he would get, get into fortified towns by tying little little twigs onto birds and setting fire up to them, and then the birds would fly into the towns looking for their babies, and the towns would go up um, in flames. Um, this, was, this, was, this was common procedure. It's a standard thing, and we don't, I mean, this is just a standard thing in the, um, in the literature. But he, 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 anyway, according to the literature, he was doing all these things um, successfully. He also, of course, managed to catch the fancy of the Empress Zoe, and he blinded the emperor. And indeed, historically, he may have been the person who actually blinded Michael V there in 1042, in which case he would have been working in conjunction with Zoe, who was getting rid of this relative. Um, Michael, in fact, indeed, was also castrated. Um, we've got beyond the period when they thought it was adequate just to kill people. Now they think it's much better to maim them. That's characteristic of the Normans. It's characteristic of what goes on in the Byzantine world. Well, back to the Norwegian world, to the Scandinavian world, we have a praise poet, Theodulf, busy praising um, our um, Harold, um, in one of these um, scaldic poems, um, these, these praise poets sort of attach themselves to sponsors, and so, of course, they're biased in sponsors' favor, but they don't usually say things, we think, that are completely untrue. Okay, the warrior who fed the wolves ripped out both the eyes of the emperor of Byzantium. Strife was unleashed again. The warrior king of Norway marked his cruel revenge on the brave emperor of the East. The Greek king had betrayed him. Well, obviously, there's a story here, and there are many stories attached to how Harold eventually became king of Norway. He used a lot of his trickster tricks, um, and I can't go into all this now. But what I will note is that he failed in his attempt to add England to his territories because he and his army were taken by surprise by the English army. He'd been very successful. He'd arrived in northern England. He'd rampaged. The, the bodies were heaped up. They were walking over bodies, according to the records. York just gave in to him without, without an, any fighting at all, even though by that time York was English. Um, and he was just getting ready to go in and set himself up as king in York, and his men were presumably all totally drunk round about when the English army su surprised him. Um, so this is, he was a poet too, 
um, this is how he put it. We go forward into battle without armor against blue blades. Helmets glitter. My coat of mail and all our armor are at our ships. Well, then he commented, that was a poor verse. I'll have to make a better one. And this is his better one. We never kneel in battle before the storm of weapons and crouch behind our shields. So the noble lady told me, she told me once to carry my head always high in battle, where swords seek to shatter the skulls of doomed warriors. Naturally, he fought with customary valor. He was killed by an arrow in the throat. Even if England did not finally become part of Scandinavia, there can be no doubt of the very great impact the Vikings had on the English-speaking world. More than 1,400 place names in England today have Scandinavian elements. They're marked by dots on the map. Um, they're the town names that sort of end with B, Grimsby, Thorpe, um, Cuttlethorpe, Toft, Thwait, that kind of name. We also have some 400 words of Scandinavian origin surviving into the modern standard language. And in the dialects, the English dialects, there are some 600 or more. Now, predictably, the first words that made it into English tended to be technical terms for boats, weapons, that sort of thing. But later, the words seem more ordinary, and they've often stuck. Words like anger, band, bank, birth, both, call, cusp, clip, crave, crook, dirt, dregs, egg, fellow, happy, law, low, loose, odd, rotten, same, scant, seemly, sister, sly, tattered, ugly, window, wrong, husband, sky. The pronouns they, them, there come through from Scandinavian. And we also have doublets like shirt versus skirt, church versus kirk, ditch versus dyke, shrub versus scrub, where that palatal sh sound is English, is Anglo-Saxon, and the, the vela k, sk sound is Scandinavian. Of course, ultimately, English and Scandinavian, the Scandinavian languages are related as Germanic. Um, they're all, all Germanic languages. And in fact, um, English and Scandinavian were close enough to the end of our period, to 1066, that we can assume there was a high degree of mutual intelligibility. Um, well, the fact that English has absorbed so many words from Scandinavian must have seemed reassuringly familiar to the 19th and early 20th century Scandinavian immigrants to North America, and particularly this part of the world. Well, as I noted in my blurb, on the 14th of August, 2007, Denmark apologized for her part in the 9th century Viking invasions of Ireland. I saw the notice that I've Xeroxed to show it's true on your handout. I saw this by chance in one of the free newspapers that they provide on the London Tube. I was on my way to Heathrow. Now, I did know that there was a Viking ship being taken over there, but I didn't know about the apology, so I was interested. Um, I guess it's for you to decide whether the Danes should also apologize for their part in the invasions of England. Thank you very much. <laughs>